Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Join believers from around the globe to study the Bible with Andrew Womack and instructors from Karis Bible College. Hello and good evening. I want to welcome you to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. My name is Julianne Harris and I will be your hostess this evening. So let me go through the announcements that I always do each time I host. This is an interactive Bible study and we want you to interact with us. So as you're listening to Robert share this evening, you're going to have questions that come into your mind. We want those questions from you. In whatever forum you are watching, we want you to go down to the chat section and type those questions in. Then the last 10 to 15 minutes of this program, we're going to get to as many of your questions as we possibly can. You also can interact with us by becoming a partner of this ministry. Uh, it's absolutely unbelievable the miraculous things that we see happen in people's lives through the Word of God that comes through Karis or comes through Andrew Womack Ministries. And you can be a part of all of that fruit simply by being a partner or by giving. So I would encourage you to consider becoming a partner and you can give by going to awmi.net slash give or give us a call at 719-635-1111. Also, in order to interact, you need to know our schedule. So let me go over that right quick in case you are new tuning in. On Mondays and Fridays, we have Bible study at 10 a.m. Tuesdays and Thursdays is at 6 p.m and Wednesday morning is at 7 a.m. and that is all mountain time. So please calculate that out, tune in while we are live. And last but not least, we have prayer ministers available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So no matter what time you are watching this program, if you need prayer, please do not hesitate to give us a call at 719-635-1111. And a trained prayer minister would love to speak with you and uh, point you towards the Word of God, point you towards supplemental teaching. It would be absolutely powerful for you to do that. So without further ado, I get to introduce our uh, guest speaker tonight, who is Robert Fenske. He is uh, zooming in or live streaming in all the way from Australia, from Gold Coast, Australia. And so it is definitely a different time of day and a different day over there. So for those of you that are watching from different countries, see, you can calculate it out and tune in while we're live, just like Robert's doing. <laughs> Praise God. So, amen. amen. So Robert and Rebecca are originally from Canada. I always love uh, telling your guys' uh, brief summary of your story. I know it's not your story, but they were originally from Canada. Robert was a firefighter, and they felt called to come to Karis, and so they did one year online. They came here uh, to Woodland Park, finished their schooling, mm -hmm. and then from here they went to Gold Coast, Australia. So Robert is the director of AWM over there, and his wife Rebecca is the director of the Karis location there in Gold Coast. So welcome, Robert. We are ready for your part two of your series. Amen. Thanks, Amen. Julianne. Yeah. It's such a blessing to be here with you guys again and to uh, dive into the word and encourage you and inspire you to uh, hopefully move into what God's calling you to. And so this is going to be part two of what I began the last time I saw you guys, which was ordinary can do extraordinary. And I have been really blessed as God has been leading me through studying out Nehemiah and how such an ordinary guy with an ordinary position, I mean, his job was pouring wine for the king, um, stirred up a passion in him as God showed a need and a desire for something that needed to be done that eventually drove him to creating a plan, putting things in place, and then moving forward with that. And that's inspirational for all of us because each and every one of us, God is asking us and calling us to do certain things. And it's not about how many talents and gifts and things that you think that you have or how ordinary you think you are. Nehemiah is a pretty good example of how we can still go on to do extraordinary things. So I want to start with part two of this, and I've got three more points that I wanted to highlight to you. The and there's, there's so much in this book, we're not going to be able to get to it all. But I have three more points that I want to tack on to the other three that I shared last time. And the first point that I want to point out is you've got to put action to your plan. So last time I ended on the third point, which was have a plan. And I, I ended up saying at the end of that, that uh, many of you have heard the statement, failing to plan is planning to fail. 
Well, God had put a plan in Nehemiah's heart, and because of that plan being stirred up in him, he was able to articulate it properly to the king, which gave him opportunity to move forward and get the um, and get the the, um, the the privilege of the king to um, fund it and move on with that. Amen. But how many of you know you can have a plan, but you could also have a plan, sit it on the shelf, and it doesn't do you a whole lot of good if you don't put action to it. Without action, it's just an idea with potential. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think all of us have got some pretty good ideas with potential uh, in our bags or on the shelf somewhere. But I want to encourage you that as, as I was going through this too, the Lord was just really has been inspiring me to kind of take some of those and start looking at those again. Um, I like you, many of you may have heard things like this, but Miles Monroe uh, said it this way, the wealthiest place on the planet is just down the road. It's the cemetery. There lie buried companies that were never started, inventions that were never made, best-selling books that were never written, and masterpieces that were never painted. In the cemetery is buried the greatest treasure of untapped potential. And so we want to look at Nehemiah as going, man, there wasn't there there was a potential and he moved forward with it. So going into the story now, Nehemiah, he's gotten the approval, he's got the plan, and he's deciding I'm going to take action to this plan. So he goes to the city, and while he's in the city, he's there for three days, and he tells no one why he's in the city, nobody what he's doing there, and he goes out at night to look at the city and the walls. Again, from what we can tell, Nehemiah has not been to this city before. He hasn't seen the walls. He hasn't even known what the construction's going to take, the massive project it's going to take. But he did give the king a criteria. He gave the king a time frame as to what it was going to take for him to do it. Man, that is a massive leap of faith um, and has encouraged, encouraged me when, it, when, I, when I've looked at that. So he's gone out there and he's, and he's seen what needs to be done in the night and said nothing. Once he surveyed the situation, then he goes on to talking to the people. And we see this in Nehemiah 2.17. So so let's read that. He says this, Then I said to them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste, and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer be a reproach. You know, back in those days, a city uh, or a nation that didn't have a wall around its city wasn't really considered a nation. They were just kind of some people, nomads, just kind of wandering around. And so Nehemiah had been stirred up to bring Israel back to the nation that it was. One of the things that this highlighted to me um, was that, and and it birthed in my heart, um, that no matter what, no matter what our background um, and where we're from, God is going to make a way. You know, no one knew Nehemiah, but they knew the king and could see the passion that God had stirred up in him for this task. You know, be encouraged. You know, you you, God may ask you to go somewhere. And, you know, how many of us would go somewhere when nobody knows who we are? Nobody knows who we are. We don't have any contacts as far as we know. This is what Nehemiah did. But he but he had God behind him and he was determined to see it done. I'd also like to point out one thing to you guys, too, that God, again, is a generational God. You may have heard me say this multiple times, but Nehemiah actually wasn't starting from scratch. Ezra had gone in there, and they had rebuilt the temple, and they had had plans to try to rebuild the wall and rebuild the city, but it hadn't happened. So now Nehemiah was coming in with this passion God had put in his heart, and he was building off of what had already started to take place. You know, many times the vision you are walking out Uh, is laying a foundation for others to take to that next level. Or you're the one God will use to complete the vision already given to someone else. It doesn't always have to come or be your own vision. And many of you may be out there saying, well, I don't really have a vision. I don't know what that vision is. I'm not sure what God's calling me to. Well, this is the advice I would give you. If you don't have a vision of your own right now, then help someone else with theirs. Many times doing this, you will grow in faithfulness, become more usable and teachable to where God will start highlighting vision and direction for yourself. I know I've seen this happen in my own life. Even when I was wondering, Lord, what's the next step? What am I to do? Uh, The Lord directed me to start helping somebody else grow their ministry, grow their vision. And I knew that that wasn't necessarily the end goal, but I didn't have a full understanding of what the next step looked like. And as I was doing that, God made everything very clear and things started to come together. 
So that is one of the things that you can do to start moving forward, right? And, and start putting action to your plan. You may not have a vision now, but start becoming a person of action. Start helping somebody else with, with something that God has um, given them to do. And, and things will come down, down the road. The next point I wanted to point out was number five. It is commit to the work involved. And this is a big one. We need to determine in our hearts that once God has given us direction, then there is no turning back. Amen. We've got to determine that. We've got to decide that in our heart. You know, um, I've heard this act, I've heard this said many times. Ministry is spelled W O R K. But as I was meditating on that, the, I, the Lord speaks to me in acronyms sometimes, and it helps me remember things. But I felt like He gave me ministry is spelled W O R C. And that stands for willing, obedient, rigorous commitment. And it's and we have to be committed. We have to be committed to what God's called us to. Yeah. We have to be Amen. willing. We have to be obedient. And we've got to be rigorous in moving forward with it, being committed to that task, but then seeing it to completion. It's mm -hmm. one thing to have the vision, but it's another thing to put your hand to the plow and be committed to see it accomplished, right? Unfortunately, yeah. we live in a world or being committed to anything in life is not being modeled very well or very much. We can see that, right? Uh, many times we are only willing to commit to something if it fits our needs, our lifestyle, and is comfortable to us. But it's not always going to be comfortable. God's going to take us out of our comfort zones a lot of times. Um, why? Because that helps build our faith and helps us rely on Him. Again, if we, if we only ever did everything that we were good at, um, we wouldn't see, you know, very many things accomplished in our lives. We've got to step out and we've got to trust God and we've got to believe that he's going to add his supernatural to our natural. Amen. Amen. Um, and that's also why God sent us the comforter. You're going to be uncomfortable at times, but we have the Holy Spirit and he's our comforter. Mm. So I want to encourage you with this. Let's go to Hebrews 10 36 and read that. It says, for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. And Hebrews 12, 1 says, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. We've got to commit. I don't know about you guys or most of you, but what I have experienced in my own life is that when I've been running a race or I see other people professionally running a race, <laughs> most of the time, from what I can tell, it's taken them out of their comfort zones physically. And especially if they're pushing to actually win the race and not just be a participant. Amen. You're gonna push, you're gonna push yourself. You're gonna be pushing for that, that finish line. You're gonna be pushing to be successful. And that can be uncomfortable sometimes because really our flesh is weak and we go, our, our normal sit down and go to a lot of times is laziness if we allow ourselves to get there. So you've got to train yourself to think differently and train yourself to move forward in these in these areas. I like this. Um, I like this statement I came across one time too, and th and this this is to, to to encourage you as well. Talking about just ordinary, those who are blessed with the most talent don't necessarily outperform everyone else. It's the people with follow through who excel. Are you a person that is? cultivating an attitude of follow through in everything that you do. That's going to help you move forward with what God's called you to. And it doesn't mean you have to be the best talented, have the best abilities, have all those things. I think every one of you could probably think of stories that you've heard of where some pretty ordinary people did some pretty incredible things because they just committed themselves and had follow through and they followed through with what has been put in their heart. So be encouraged. Amen. How we start to do this is even today, you can start to do this. You can build a habit of committing and following through with tasks and jobs. Just, just have it in your heart that I'm going to follow through with what it is that I commit myself to. This will recreate a habit for when God gives you a vision to complete. Start something small and work your way up. Man, God's been challenging me with this. And there's a number of different things that I'm like, man, that's a big vision. And he's like, just start with something small. Just start somewhere. Commit to this. And so I'm really being challenged myself with God saying, come on, start the process and get things rolling. Um, and so all of us can do that. That helps create that habit of follow through and seeing things to completion. And even if you realize in the middle of it, you go, you know what? 
this isn't for me. I know this isn't my future. Man, God's challenged me with that multiple times in my life. I've spent years doing something I knew that really wasn't going to be a huge part of my future, but God had not given me a direction to move on from that. And so I followed through until I came to completion. And then when I came to completion, the next step was presented to me. And God told me what that next step was. A lot of times later on too, though, down the road, that is never wasted time. How do you know that, you know, uh, preparation time is never wasted time. God doesn't waste time. And so all those times when I knew it wasn't something that was going to be really attached to my future, man, I tell you, it all came to pass and great things came from it that helped me to grow, to see myself better successful in my future. So stick it out, commit to what is in front of you and keep going till God gives you direction otherwise. Amen. Create that heart of follow through. And number six, the last point here that we'll spend a little bit of time on because I, th- I think this is really important and we all run through this and I'm seeing it more and more all the time is be prepared for opposition. Dun, dun, dun. I know nobody really likes to think about that. And I'm not saying that you should meditate on it. I'm not saying that you always have to be, you know, worried about stuff coming your way and all of that. Okay. That's not where we put our focus. But the point is, guys, that when you put action to the plan God has birthed in you and commit to it, you are going to make some people and the adversary very uncomfortable and upset, to say the least. It's just going to happen. So you've got to be ready for that. And Nehemiah is such a great example of this. Notice that as soon as Nehemiah started putting action to his plan, he faced adversity right off the bat. Things started being said, stuff started being done, and right away he had people confronting him. With great achievements come adversity, criticism, trials, challenges. These are just to name a few things. Um, But... Remember, I love what Greg Moore says, but where are you putting your butt? Remember (laughs) that, (laughs) like I said before, Uh, one plus God is the majority. And look at what Jesus has told us. John 16, 33. (laughs) Many of you have heard this, but we can't go over it enough. These things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In who? In Jesus. We have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. Not many of us like that part, but it's just part of it. We're living in a fallen world. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And that statement, overcome, have overcome in the Greek, um, one of the meanings there for Christians, it says that hold fast their faith even unto death against the power of their foes, the temptations and persecutions. So we've just got to have that attitude of follow through and commitment that, you know, we got to keep moving forward. And God's, Jesus has already overcome for us. He's, he's opened the doors to, for victory in every situation. We just have to be willing to walk that out with him. Amen. So you see here in Nehemiah 2.10, right off the bat, he starts getting criticism. And, they, and they're upset at him. It says uh, in verse uh, 10, I'm just going to read the later half of that. It says, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Man, when you come to seek the well-being of anybody and advance the kingdom of God, people are going to be disturbed. They're not going to like it. So first, the first thing that happens a lot of times, and I've experienced this in my own life, comes the mind games. Guys, these are going to happen. It's going to happen. Look at Nehemiah 4.1. And then you, actually, I'm going to, for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of go, if you look at Nehemiah 4, chapter 1, uh, or four, chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, this is what happens. He gets, these guys come against them, they get furious, and it says very indignant. And then at the end of that, in verse 3, if you go to verse 3, look at what they say here. Now, Tobiah the uh, Ammonite was beside him, and he said, whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he will, it will break down their stone wall. So here he is criticizing, you guys don't know what you're doing. You don't know how to build a wall. They've got to collect the stones because the stones are there. They're all in rubbish and they're all in piles. They've got to dig them out of the ground. They've got to get them. They've got to build this wall. And he's like, forget it. You guys don't know what you're doing. A fox is going to come and they're going to collapse. So he's already playing mind games and trying to get them off track. Then that didn't work out. So what comes next? Then comes the threats. So in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 8, we read this. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. 
This is one of the biggest tactics of the enemy, guys. It's the to create confusion. The enemy knows he doesn't have the authority to stop you from doing what God's called you to because you have the authority over him. But he tries to bring confusion to get you off course and have you quit yourself. This is one of his biggest tools. So now what has to take place? And this is encouraging to me, too, when it comes to Nehemiah. First off, Nehemiah has had to jump into all kinds of roles that, from what we can tell, he may not have had previous experience with. And now what? <laughs> now Nehemiah's got the face of an uh, or the threat of an army coming, and he's got to become a military leader. What experience does he have with this? Well, maybe I would say he's probably learned a few things being in the king's court. But at the same time, don't you think he probably had to have a pretty heavy reliance upon God as far as yeah. the tactic and the plan that he was going to have to take? Yeah, I would say he did. Amen. Amen. But but he was willing to do that. So remember who's with you, beside you and in you. And look what Nehemiah said. And this is what he said to the people. Nehemiah chapter four, verse 14 says not. And he says to the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord great and awesome. Man, we need to say that to ourselves every day sometimes. Remember the Lord, great and awesome. And fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. The task had to go on, and he encouraged them, we've got to keep going. They didn't stop because of the potential threat. A lot of times we end up stopping because we see obstacles and trials and things starting to come our way. You know, when God gives us a task sometimes, it's not just going to always be like open doors and everybody excited about it. We're going to face some adversity and we're going to have to learn to get over that and just kind of get some tough skin going. Yeah, nice try, enemy. You're not going to stop me from doing what God's called me to. Um, man, it's, it's, it's one of those things that we really have to we really have to consider. And again, consider this God being a generational God. What you are doing and what God is asking you to do and putting on your heart to do, Nehemiah pointed this out too. He said, look, you're not just doing this for yourself. He said, think about the brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your houses. This is for the future of this nation. Well, a lot of times the tasks that we're doing, you know, I was thinking about it. You could consider it, it's for the future of advancing the kingdom of God. That's a pretty big, that's a pretty big thing. Your little thing may be, seem insignificant to you, but I'm telling you, it, we're the body of Christ, and we all work together to see the body work and function and operate in a better capacity. Amen? Amen. So what happened? They made adjustments. They made adjustments and keep going. I love this. Look at Nehemiah 417. He says to them, those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other held a weapon. Man, that sounds like fun. Talk about making the task a little bit more challenging. Right. Um, all of a sudden they're building a wall and now they got to now they got to keep swords by their side and they got to watch over their shoulder. But they didn't stop. They kept going. This is an encouragement to us that, you know, things are going to happen. Just keep moving forward. So then in Nehemiah 10, or 6, chapter 6, verse 10, he gets hit with another obstacle. And this is the one I want to share with you guys and end on this and encourage you because this comes to all of us. And we all face these things. But Nehemiah was faced with spies and people inside that were causing issues. Um, we see in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 10, there was an informant, someone that was a secret informer. And he had come and told him that there was a plan to kill Nehemiah. And he said to him, let's go to the, let's go to the uh, tabernacle. Let's lock ourselves into the temple and then you'll be safe. But his plan was to try to tarnish Nehemiah's character. Nehemiah knew that it, the temple was a place for the priests and he was not a priest. And it was not somewhere that he was supposed to go in. And because of his character, he said, who am I? It doesn't matter if somebody's called or, or saying that they're going to kill me. I am going to honor God still in everything that I do. And I'm not going to enter that temple. We have to be determined in our hearts as well that we're going to continue to honor God. They're going to come. They're going to try to tarnish your character. People are going to say things. You've got to just stay true and keep your character um, in line and not give it the time of day. <laughs> 
Then they, then they also did this. You see this, and this is another big fear tactic or another tactic of the enemy. In chapter 6, Nehemiah mentions uh, four times in verse 9, 13, 14, and 19, he mentions to make us afraid, uh, that I should be afraid, who would have made me afraid. Are you guys catching the, catching the whole thing here? Yeah. Uh, and then sent letters to frighten me. The enemy is trying again to confuse you and make you afraid of things that God has called you to do. And it's going to come from all different places. But don't let the, that fear consume you. Again, many of you have heard the acronym false evidence appearing real. You know, it's, it, may be, it may be facts in that moment, but the truth is God is greater and he's with you. And if he's called you to do it, there's nothing that can stop you. Amen. Um, I like this quote by Lester Summerall. He says, a champion's only fear is that of falling short of the mark God has set for him. Amen. Now, does that mean that we need to uh, live in fear that we're never accomplishing what God called us to? Absolutely not. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And I don't think there's anybody out there that can say they've done it perfectly. But the point being is we should have more of a fear of not, a, not accomplishing and doing what God's called us to than the outside fear that's trying to stop us and is trying to um, keep us weighed down from doing anything at all. Don't Amen. let that fear consume you. Okay. And then this is the last thing that I wanted to highlight to you guys because it's a big one that seems to be happen that that seems to have hindered a lot of people. It's the it's the um, how could we say this? It's the backstabbing that has happened. And Nehemiah faced this. You can see this. Um, the head priest, who was the head of all of the people. Uh, gave Tobiah, one of the people that caused him the greatest amount of adversity, a special room in the temple while Nehemiah was away going back to the king. Nehemiah comes back and finds out that the, the priest, the head priest had given him this special room in the temple and he's got to change it all and make it all right and clean the room and he kicks all of Tobiah's stuff out of the room. You know, there's lots of us out there. How many of us have felt like we've been done wrong by, uh, by leadership? Or leadership felt like they've been done wrong by those that are following them? This is an ongoing thing, but you've got to stand your ground and realize, look, people are people. Nobody's always going to do it right. I'm probably going to make mistakes and hurt people in my life. I'm not speaking that and prophesying that. I'm just saying that because I'm still human. And I don't always do everything that I know that I should do. Praise God, I'm working on it. Amen. But people are people and they're going to make mistakes. Don't let that stop you. Don't let that deter you from moving forward with what God's called you to. Um, you've got to keep moving forward. I've heard so many, I've heard a number of times of people that their ministries just fell apart because they had been um, hurt or so hurt by those that had been around them. I believe God had far more in store for them. But, but look, none of us want to go through that, but don't let it stop you. Nehemiah went on to, cre to do great things for that country and for that nation. So despite all these challenges, Nehemiah completed the wall around Jerusalem in just 52 days. That was a miracle in itself. And went on to bring the nation of Israel back to a godly foundation, honoring God and his ways. Amen. So be yeah. encouraged that an ordinary man of character, inspired by God, stirred up passion that envisioned a plan and was followed through to completion, impacting a nation and generations to come. We are generation changers. God puts things in our heart and it is going to have a ripple effect when we have that heart of hope, through commitment and just putting action to it. Amen. No matter how ordinary you think you are, you are the perfect candidate. God is excited to do extraordinary things through you when you answer his call and are committed to follow through no matter what. So be committed, brothers and sisters. Follow through. Nehemiah is a great example of somebody who, you know, we would consider pretty ordinary, went on to do great things and laid a foundation for a nation that helped them to move forward um, in God and, uh, and, and what God had, you know, blessed them with and what he'd called them to. Amen. Amen. Man, that's powerful, Robert. It's so good. I love how you gleaned all of that from the book of Nehemiah. It's so great. So we got some great questions. Are you ready? 
Ah, uh, Holy Spirit's always ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have Amber on YouTube that says, how can we get tough skin when we have a sensitive heart? Mm, that's a good question. Yeah, it is. And that's, and actually that's something too. Look, I'm, I, you know, I think we all have to walk through that because it's not, it's not tough skin doesn't mean hardening your heart. Yeah. You want to keep your heart soft. You want to keep your heart soft towards people. You want to keep your heart soft towards God. But I think the tough skin part is recognizing that, you know what? People are flawed. God loves people. You know, ask the Holy Spirit, what's the best way for you to see this turnaround or this change? Some people may just, um, I've heard stories. God's given them a revelation of how much God loves them and how much God loves people. And so that has just completely transformed them. It's hard for them to see people in a bad light because they realize how much God loves them. Um, things along those lines. It's, it's really uh, understanding that there is going to be opposition. There's going to be people that operate in the flesh and have their flesh flashes. And um, when you recognize that and see that, you just you have grace for it. We all have to have grace for one another. And you move forward knowing that, you know what, this is just the enemy. This is the enemy trying to distract me. It's the enemy trying to take my attention from what I need to be focusing on. And you, you start throwing it off yourself more. It's like that water off a duck's back. Yeah. Start yeah. learning to just let it go, let it go, let it go. And as yeah. you do that, then you, you become more immune to those you know, those tactics, those things that come your way, those, those um, criticisms and all of those things. Let them go. Just let them go. I know it's harder and it's, it's easier said than done, but we've all got to, we've all got to just learn to, to let that go. Keep your eyes on Jesus and the task that is before you. Amen. I, I think that's so key. You know, for me personally, it's like, I am continually reminding myself that I do everything that I do to an audience of one. And so Amen. if I keep my heart pure before him to know that I've done it to the best of my ability, it doesn't really matter what other people do or say because I'm, I'm good with him, right? And, and he's my yeah. ultimate boss. So yeah, that's awesome. Um, Amen. But it doesn't take away the fact that sometimes it hurts, right? When people mm -hmm. uh, do that. So yeah, but not hardening your heart. I love how you mentioned that. And I feel like that needs to be uh, clear too, Amber, is that's, I think, the easiest defense me mechanism we can have, right? To be like, I'll never. And then close yeah. the gates. And we can't do that because then we're hardening our, uh, hardening our heart to God too, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and we don't want that. No, we don't. Okay, so Toomey on chat says, how do you put action to God's plan? And once you take that step, how do you know it's the right step? Oh, amen. I think, I think, uh, I think really it all begins first off with just having that willing obedience. Like amen. I said, that W-O-R-C. Um, willing obedience. When the Lord highlights something to you, Commit in your heart that you're going to be obedient to what God is highlighting, whether that's loving somebody more, whether that's whatever it is, as you're reading the word and as the Holy Spirit highlights things to you, as you are committed to just that obedience and, and putting action to what the Holy Spirit's bringing to your attention, then more things will be brought to your attention. So um, how do you how do you walk that out? You just you start slowly putting action to what the Holy Spirit's highlighting to you. Amen. And um, it could be anything, you know, um, man, the Holy Spirit highlighted to me a while ago. And look, I'm just being vulnerable and open with you guys uh, that I needed to um, start journaling more. I needed to write things down more. Um, I haven't been very good at that, but I've got to start doing that again and putting just Amen. that action in place. Even if it's a paragraph a day, uh, it would create that habit of me starting to put actions to a plan. And so Amen. I could say, that's my plan right now. Do, be do better journaling. Amen. As simple as that. Yeah, so good, so good. And then, you know, God leads us by the peace. That's how you know it's the right thing, right? That's right, yeah, absolutely, yeah. How do you know it's God? Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Julianne. I'm, I yeah. missed that last part. It's right. God's peace. You just follow God's peace. And uh, that doesn't, there is some learning in that because just because 
um, you'll have obstacles and trials, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't mean that it's not God. Like, right. you can have peace in adversity. And sometimes it's hard to distinguish. People go, oh, it's just, I, I don't have peace because I'm being attacked and all these things are happening. No, that you've got to learn to distinguish between that's your own emotions and not and not what God is doing. So it's it's just walking that out and learning that. Um, yeah, learning that process. It's so much easier to just shriek back when we have a lack of peace is what we call it, <laughs> only when it's just adversity. I think I think the hardest time for me to discern peace or lack thereof is before I take the step, right? Because it's kind of mm -hmm. like, it's a big step, it's kind of scary, you're really having to depend on God to do this step, you know, it's kind of like you're doing that, I do that scary laugh, you know, it's like, <laughs> okay, and so, <laughs> But it's that that's when it's hardest for me to be like, is this a lack of peace or is this just me struggling to take that step of faith? Right. Because once I've determined in my heart, then I feel like it's super it's a lot easier to sense the peace or lack thereof. And you know what? I want to add something to this because yeah. I've done things that I know hmm, maybe weren't necessarily God's best at that mm -hmm. time. Right. But my heart was in the right place. That's and so good. honestly, if your heart's in the right place and you're doing it out of a heart to be obedient to the Lord, you can't lose. Because Amen. even if it's not exactly what God is wanting you to go in that direction, he can recalculate that and keep moving yes. you forward. Again, yes. we want to keep moving forward. So you don't have to be so worried about, well, is it the right thing? Do I do this? Do I not do this? If your heart is to be pleasing to God and be obedient to what he's highlighting to you, there's learning Amen. along the way. We've all got to learn to communicate better when it comes to listening to God. Amen. But you don't have to be concerned that it's going to be the wrong thing and I'm going to make this drastic mistake because God sees your heart. And so he'll Amen. just kind of fine tune it and bring you back into where he's wanting you to go. And uh, really, it's better for you to be moving forward than not doing anything. Yeah. The, the frozen chosen is not a good yeah. place to be. <laughs> no. Okay, so uh, we'll keep on with the, the um, questions. So uh, J.U. on Facebook says, how do you cast that fear? Cast it. How do you cast that fear? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, here's one of the ways that I've I've done it um, in the past, and I think, you know, it's a it's a pretty good biblical grounding. What did Nehemiah do when 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 they were the, the threat of the attack came? What did Nehemiah do? Remember how great and awesome our Lord is. Amen. Remind yourself, you serve a God of the like impossible. There's nothing impossible for God. And there is nothing that he can't do through you when he's empowered you to do it. Put yourself back in a position where you're seeing God and magnifying God greater than the fears that are coming your way. That's going to cast off the fears because they're not going to have anywhere to live. Um, I used to I used to do this thing and I need to do it more often. I, sometimes I still do it, but I, I build my imagination where something will come my way and then I'll go, well, wait a minute. God, you're bigger than this. And I'll just deliberately play a game where I'll think of one of the most craziest outlandish things that I could think that God could do to change the situation because he's that big. There's awesome. nothing I could think of that would be impossible for God to do. So therefore, if I go that avenue, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait a minute. This is really, this isn't really that much. This isn't that big a deal, you know? Oh, that's uh, awesome. And, 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 and you, you realize, man, I, I serve an awesome God. There, I don't have to be fearful of anything. Amen. That's so good. I'm, I'm going to use Amen. that one, just so you know. <laughs> um, so <laughs> Lee, Lee Ann on Facebook says, what if you have not obeyed God when he clearly has told you what to do, but fear of man got in the way and uh, you doing what God, fear, it, fear of man got in the mm. way of you doing what God told you to do? What do you do in that situation? Well, praise God. You, that, I mean, that's exciting if you've recognized that fact. Amen. That's the first step. You just look to God, repent, 
and you move back in that direction. God's a restor restorer of the time. He can redeem the time. He can bring things back to and back together. Uh, there's again, we serve a God of 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 the impossible. So no matter how you've missed it, how many years you've missed it, whatever you think has taken place, God can still put it. I guarantee you. God's our biggest cheerleader up there. Sometimes I imagine this too. You know, we made a mistake. We're like, oh, wow, I missed that one. And God's going, no problem. Hey, listen, this is nothing for me. Come on, move it. Get up. Let's keep going. You saw it. And he's so excited that you saw you missed it. He's yeah. just got all of heaven cheering you on because you just, <laughs> you broke through that moment. And now you've got an opportunity to move forward. Amen. Just move forward. Don't 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 look at the past. Don't don't start focusing on the past or what you think you lost and the time you lost. We all have that opportunity. So but that's good. really what where Satan wants us to go. To just get into that whole vortex of, you know, what could have been and what maybe could have taken place. Well, God's bigger than that. So whatever I think I have lost, man, there is no losing with God when you are focused on God and doing what he's called you to do. You can't lose. Mm, so good. So good. Uh, Tim on chat says, on your last point, I suffered a period of severe disappointment in people. I don't hold mm. resentment. It just took a lot of the joy out of my life. I'm slowly coming back, but how can I regain hope, faith, and joy again? Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep looking to Jesus. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. You You've got to realize we are the body of Christ. God made us for relationships. We are relational people. I mean, he made Adam and said, well, it's not good that he's alone. So he created Eve. And then we, we were created for relationship. In relationships, there's opportunities for things to take place. I get it. I get it. And trust has to be built up again and earned in relationships. But you've got to determine in your heart that if, in order for us to move forward with what God has called us to, he's called us to be relational and he's called those people around us to help us, to move us forward, to grow us, excel us in what God's called us to do. And so if you see that and recognize that, you realize you've, you've, you've got to move forward. If you want to move forward with what God's put in your heart, you've got to let go of those things and move forward. Now, sure, there may be a time of, of, of building trust again, um, all those kinds of things, but, but you do have to learn to trust. You've got to learn to trust. And stuff is going to happen. Look, if it happened to Jesus, this is what I keep looking at. I'm not sure why, but look at what happened to Jesus. Jesus is our, is our perfect example. Mm -hmm. He's got 12 guys he spent three years with. He's got three that are in his inner circle. And what happened at the end? They all left. Yeah. In his moment of need. Even his closest friends, he tried to get them to pray with him in one of his most distressful situations, and they couldn't even do that. You can see where Jesus was a little bit, you know, frustrated, if Jesus could be frustrated, coming and saying, guys, why are you sleeping? I need you praying with me, right? There's, even they, you know, Jesus, Jesus was put down or let down by the people around him. But look what happened. It didn't stop him. It didn't deter him from doing what God called him to, from loving them and loving us and going through what he went through on that cross because he loved us. He loved us more than, than the hurt or the turmoil or the rejection that he faced. And so maybe this is part of it too. Love God greater than anything that's happening in your life Amen. and those other things will fall aside. Take yourself into that position where your love for God is just beyond excelling what you've ever been or experienced. Grow in that relationship. And I guarantee you, as you grow in your revelation of God and God's love for you, a lot of these other things will just start to fall aside because they're yeah. just, they're going to be meaningless. At the end of the day, you're going to get to heaven and see the glory of God and who he is. And I guarantee you, you are not going to think of any of those people that hurt you or did things wrong to you. That's not going to be a part of your thought process. And okay. we need to get there here now, realizing this is about eternity and we're called to impact people for Christ. Yeah, that's and it. we need to we need to just let these things go um, yeah. so that we can move forward in our own lives and be more of a blessing to others at the same time. Amen. It's and it's part of having that vision, right? Because where there is no mm -hmm. vision, the people perish. And that's what you look yeah. at Nehemiah. That's that's exactly how he could go through all the mess that he went through because he had a vision. 
right? Yeah. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. And so I think in those moments when you are so disappointed in people, you got to basically marry your purpose and your vision again, right? You, you got to just like disconnect from that and, and go, wait a second. Okay, what's my purpose and vision? Because that what that does is it separates you from the pain of that disappointment, I think, I believe. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's awesome. And we can learn that from Amen. Nehemiah. So thanks for sharing that, Robert. So good, so good. And all the Q&A. So those of you that submitted a question and we were unable to get to your question, uh, please tune back into Facebook um, pay our Facebook Karis Bible College page and we do a Q&A roundup every Tuesday afternoon so please do that and your question will probably get answered and thank you so much Robert this is just a powerful message oh it was a privilege and uh, I'm inspired as well to move forward I've been challenged yeah. through this whole thing so I hope you guys are challenged and encouraged and inspired as well Amen. Man, I know I certainly am. And don't forget, everybody, we have live Bible study tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. So everyone have a good night. And we'll see you next time, Robert. We'll see all you viewers next time as well. Bye. See you next time. You were created with a purpose. Written in the heart of God long before you were born. He is calling you to find it. You were born for such a time as this, to be a disciple, to leave this world behind and follow him. You were designed for a destiny, one that only you can fulfill. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the world. We want to help you to know God, experience His unconditional love,